Uh, one of the senior physios here, um, and in the last year I've been trying to move my, uh, my skill set towards bike fitting, um, and with particular respect to physiotherapy because I treat a lot of cyclists from all branches of the spectrum, from amateur to um, uh, elite Ironman to everyone. So we all seem to come in with a similar packet of injuries generally, um, and sometimes the more elite ones are you know, the, the, the easiest to sort out because weirdly these guys have, they have a very demanding training schedules and there's a very small problem with it that's obviously then extrapolated out to be a big deal uh, whereas uh, sometimes with other less professional people it's a bit more looking at their, their own their life like what they do at work and things like that it's a bit more complicated. Um, I use, uh, currently use the bike fit system uh, which there are several different systems. You'll probably see a few things up around, like Retool and places like that. Um, the reason I went on the bike fit one is because it was aimed at physiotherapists as opposed to everyone. Um, and I was in the start minority on the course, so one of them just uh, the guys who work in bike shops. And when it came to fitting and knowing everything about the bike and the different types of trailers or different types of saddle stems, everything, you know, they were very, very gifted at all that. But when it came to actual high ends, all right, when it came to actual biomechanics and knowledge of the body, there was a real hole in the, hole in the uh, information base. So I kind of figured that I should be doing it. Um, and I found, uh, I found personally, I found that when a lot of my patients come to see me with problems that I ask about a bike fit, they've usually had one done. I don't know whether all of you have had bike fits done, are you uh, ever interested in getting one? And usually it's t usually ranked in with the price of the bike, usually. Um, and the number one uh, question I ask is if they ever looked at the cleats and if they looked spent a lot of time looking at your foot pedal interface, that's the most important bit. There are a number of contact points on a bike, which you've probably seen, pedals, saddle, and the bars, uh, but then where your power is let down is also your pedal. So if your foot pedal, foot pedal interface is incorrect, um, you usually set up pretty incorrectly from, from the off. So the foundation isn't right generally. Um, figures here, looking at kind of revs per average, of, of, it depends what you read. Um, on a century bike, bike ride, um, most people, uh, most literature, literature points to kind of 20,000 rev revolutions. Um, but that's when the rep count is only look at one leg, so it's going to be up around 40. Um, so if you've got something where you're, you've got, you're in, if your efficiency is poor and you're maybe harboring a smaller injury, hammering that 40,000 times in a ride like that, I appreciate that everyone does a century bike ride every weekend, um, but essentially it's just a standard figure. Um, and these overuse injuries generally are quite um, prolific. Now, I, I have a couple of people coming in with you know, traumas where they've fallen off, they've not been able to clear out, and they usually like bust their shoulders or something like that. Um, but essentially, more often than not, it's very similar injuries to runners, very similar. Um, it's except you know, runner's knee is not really what you call a cycling injury, but it's the same presentation, the same kind of physiology as well. Um, and so the knee is by far the most common site of pain. Um, and I'd say for me the neck, the next one, upper traps, yes, but if I can put that in the neck, that's these, this, this bit here. Um, hip pain, I have a few, but usually these are kind of triathletes or iron, and they have a congenital hip problem, or they'll have a uh, core stability issue where they've been more affected by their running, and then the cycling is merely exacerbating it. Um, but that's because when they're crouched, flexible position, they usually spot it when the cycling more than when they're extended. Um, so bike size, oh, I should apologise, my battery is limited on here, I don't have to charge it, so I've got it up on here as well, so I'll, I'll be able to talk as you see my die. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get to the end before it does. Um, so bike, bike sizing versus a stack and reach versus a fitting. Um, bike fitting is what tends to cost a lot of money. Bike sizing and a stack and reach, bike sizing if it's done properly, will mean that the bike fitting is a lot easier. Uh, when I was looking at, well, especially when I was learning how to do this, one of the, a lot of the things that happened was someone would have their bike nicked and then they'd replace it on eBay or something like that because they have a lot of knowledge about what they want, but essentially the bike frame was wrong for them, so the, sit, the fitting was very difficult. We having to address stem size, you know, saddle position, saddle, saddle type, whereas it might have just been a simple adjustment of height or 
you can hear in there if the, if the bike sizing had been done correctly. Um, a stack of each is basically what it says, um, but it's, uh, that's where most people say they've had a bike fitting done, um, where we've been measured for uh, saddle height and distance between pelvis and wrists and all that sort of stuff, but an actual bike fitting requires cleat management, which is a bit trickier I suppose, especially with all the different types of uh, cleats out there at the moment, but um, it's a bit more of a precise way forward. Um, I suppose I'm, I work from a different uh, point of view to most places. If you're just buying a bike and you get a bike fit chucked in with it and you're quite excited about your bike, that's quite a positive thing, isn't it? You know, you, it's, everyone's quite you know, geared up to get you set up properly so you can get on and go as fast as you can, whereas the type of people I'll see right from the back have got pain. So it's, I always have a different mindset with everything. So I, I, whilst a lot of bike setting is set up for efficiency's sake, the most efficient way that you might look on the bike, that might not be the best way for that recovering Achilles tendonopathy that you've got or that back ache that just doesn't seem to want to go away. So I have a slightly different method um, and I kind of use the bike fit thing to, 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 to and kind of adopt, uh, clock it into a physiotherapy kind of setting as opposed to just messing and tinkering with screws. Um, the foot pedal interface is the number one and the most important bit and the other two, the other two follow up. Um, generally, if you jump ahead, if you do something with the handlebars and things, you should really always go back and look at the foot pedal interface as well. So if you just have a saddle high change, for example, or if you get rid of knee pain, uh, it, it, that may have thrown everything out of your to it may not have done. But when we're dealing with pain, the pain goes away, no problem, right? <laughs> um, okay. Um, this is one of the mis... Uh, there's a lot of hearsay and a lot of folklore in cycling and running alike. A lot of people, a lot of rules seem to have come out that seem to be hard and fast and that you should stick to. Uh, for example, in running, you, know, you should pretty much run more to be better at running. Absolute lie, you shouldn't have to at all. You can get really good at running by doing other things as well. And in fact, it will pepper your training. In cycling, the other one is, I see it when I'm walking, I was walking here this morning and I was walking at the Brooklyn Road and I saw a lot of guys heading down to, to the old uh, Richmond Park and all with their knees going towards the crossbar to the side of them. Um, and that's probably from some studies that were done in wind tunnels. But essentially, unless you're going a, a lot faster than you would ever be able to push on a pedal bike, that kind of, um, excuse me, that kind of wind resistance and aerodynamics just isn't a feature. It's more about efficiency of the knee. So if you, they, they're completely at risk of damaging several portions of their knee um, over a period of time. And another one is that the uh, the, the position of so the first metatarsal pedal lies over the pedal axis. Kind of, yes and no. It should be between the first and fifth. So um, I won't take my shoes off and feet are rough. But if, if your big toe is here and your little toe is here, because generally it's not level. If you were to look down at your foot, it would be like this. So you've got a point between here and here. There's like a band there where the, where the axis, axis the axis of the pedal should be. Now for you, it might be different for me. And you have to get that right. And usually it centers around how you feel in your shoe. Uh, whether you feel like you can lay power down properly um, or not. And indeed, with a lot of calf injuries in, inside them as well, the, the cleat is usually a bit too far forward, so there's a bit too much pressure on the smaller flexes of the car. Um, and yes, with the leg length discrepancies, what we take as, as a rule of thumb, um, if it's anything over one and, a half, um, one and a half inches in standing, that's deemed to be clinically significant. In cycling, it has to be a lot greater than that. But I, I can't say I've ever come across anyone with a leg length discrepancy that's over one and a half inches um, without there being some kind of medical history with that. Um, obviously, we've been on that or to one side. Um, the rule of thumb is that if you try and reduce that leg length discrepancy by half, then you're, you're, right, you're in the right ballpark. And then you can use that, you can use uh, spaces in the place to raise the height. Um, so, um, with regards to foot pedal interface, we, we look at several different things and um, 
it's quite, yeah, it can, it can take quite a while to get it into the right position. But essentially, we're looking at kind of ballpark figures. So, in terms of fore and aft, kind of what it sounds like really, how far forward or how far backward your foot needs to be on the pedal. Um, and that will be, uh, that will affect your knee angle um, in terms of your, uh, just at the bottom of your power stroke. The medial and lateral cleat, cleat position, that will take your knee either towards or away from, from the crossbar and will de-stress certain, certain portions of your knee. So if your cleat is, if your foot's too far out away from the crossbar, you're, you've got an increased likelihood to come in towards and so you'll be caving down through here using this as a kind of a friction fall point when you're, when you're moving around. So the ITB, you ever heard of that? Yeah, that's a common site of friction you use there. Um, if you were to take your cleat out, uh, so bring your foot in, it would take your, your knee out in terms of where it wants to go. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, reducing the, increasing the efficiency will reduce the likelihood of an, an insidious onset of injury, which are, and these things are usually you know, a bit more complicated to manage. Um, so you want the horizontal angle of the click position, so this would depend largely on your foot biomechanics. Um, this is where I kind of fall out of love a little bit with the bike fitting process. It seems to be, there's a lot of, as you can imagine, with foot biomechanics and the, the, the presence of the whole industry around that, like uh, podiatry for example, there's a lot of research that goes into it and a lot of very, very clever people, way cleverer than me, have gone before me and done a lot of really serious work to determine the, the relevance of foot biomechanics. When, it, when, when you look at a bike fit, a lot of the, the foot biomechanics are assessed in a non-weight bearing manner. Whereas the first thing you do when you push your pedals, you bear weight through the foot and the whole thing changes shape. So um, essentially, this is where I would probably try and put myself ahead of uh, another bike that's uh, as far as I look at foot mechanics for a living. That's what I do. Um, rotational cleat position. This is quite a big one. There's a, there's a corner, uh, there's, a, there's an area of the knee called posterior lateral corner. It's around here just at the back, and it's, it's incorporates a few structures, cartilage, um, one of the joints on the outside of the knee, which is your know, figure of the joint, uh, comes up to the joints of the tibia here, and you've got a few structures, um, uh, a complex of ligaments and tendons called the arcuate complex, arcuate arcu complex, um, and they can become quite stressed, and they can become very, very tight, um, and what happens is with a rotational cleat position issue, is you don't really notice the problem when you're on the, on the bike, it's always something else. So it would be when you're going for a run, or um, I had a classic this week actually, a, a chap, 46 years old, who ended up giving himself a degenerative meniscal tear, so basically ruptured some of the outside carpet of his knee. And he just did that by picking up some luggage at the airport, because he wasn't used to that kind of running and activity. He spent so much time in the saddle. And when, we were, when I was talking to him about his cleats, it had a fit done, and he said it felt really weirdly rotated. And so basically while he's cycling, he's been doing that the whole time on his knee, which is not very clever. Um, and he came to give himself a bit of an injury. Um, and we spoke briefly about the high additions of leg length. Um, other contact points on the bike. So saddle position, again looking at how much your knee is flexing and whether your knee is remaining over your foot while you're cycling. Um, all again focused towards laying power down in an efficient way. Um, that would be moving the saddle forwards and backwards. Uh, the knee flexion angle again altered with uh, saddle height as well. Uh, the shoulder angle typically should be at 90 degrees to your upper body, so kind of here. Uh, but then it's looking at how, where is your, what's your upper body doing. If your seat's too far back and you're reaching forward, you might look like you're 90 degrees, but you've got a horrific curve in your back. If you're really trying to overreach, and these are kind of prolonged joint problems in the back, muscular aches, that kind of thing, all can be can quite quickly sorted out just by a, 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 a quick saddle adjustment. Um, elbow flexion, we're looking at around 15 degrees, that's what you should have around 15 to 20 degrees. And your wrist position, that's a very personal thing. Uh, there's no, I've not really come across, I have come across a few numbers of what, where you should be, but it's usually in three, three planes of movement, so it's quite hard to discuss it, but essentially, if you feel comfortable with the grip, I'd be happy with that. Um, wrist position, what we're looking at is injuries like ulnar nerve problems, pins and needles tingling in the hand. Um, these are the riders that you tend to find have uh, been out bought extra padded gloves or other things like wrist supports for while they're on the bike, anything like that. Um, and it's a good clue that something's not quite right in their fit. Um, especially if you're overreaching, you're going to have an excessive um, 
usually an extended position in the wrist and what's called radial deviated. The nerve, the major nerve that's in, in call to question is your ulnar nerve, and it comes down here and passes through this portion of your, of your, of your wrist, just in what's called Guillaume's canal. I won't be an example of this, but it, you, when it comes down, um, it supplies typically these two fingers. So if you get numbness, pins and needles, anything in those two fingers, you, look, you are pretty much looking at an ulnar nerve problem. Um, but the branches of it can come out and can supply the thumb and the finger as well. But there's anatomical differences between person to person with that, but the, the typical one is, is there. But also, if you're, in an, if you're in an off position and you're overreaching, your ulnar nerve can be compressed from being in this position. But also, if I'm, if I'm reaching right down to lift my head up, that's been in that position for quite a while, I'm compressing the joints at the back of my neck. And this I see in everyone. This is not just cycling. These are my bankers who <laughs> spend all day at desks looking at spreadsheets. Um, I ride motorcycles a lot, and I'm you know, a guy who rides motorcycles will tell you about neck ache, um, usually because the bike's in a bad position where it's too, too big or too small for them, whatever. But if you compress those joints down here for long enough, what will happen is the joints become quite stiff and they tether the nerves forward. Now, that's not altogether a poor thing, it's not that, that bad, but can lead to symptoms, and that can be shoulder pain, arm pain. Sh uh, typical one is pain in the shoulder blade. Um, uh, with, it can be worse with turning the head, it might not be, but that kind of unremitting, constant need for massage or moving around, that kind of thing, but it's usually the joints down here, and that marries quite well in, with the wrist position as well. So a, a bike fit, a general flow of a bike fit will be with me uh, would be a global view, so I'll be probably video you from the front, back, and sides, show you the video um, and where I think things might could do to be altered um, and how we go back, go ahead and do it. Obviously, make the, the necessary alterations and keep filming to see if they're making the, the right adjustments. Um, anything that's massively out of place, like a saddle height that's you know way too high, that would be just changed straight away. But that's jumping ahead, so I'll be very. Um, my first port called the foot and pedal, um, and then working through the, the, um, the different interfaces there that we've just briefly spoken about. Um, well, the, 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 stem, the stem and bars, um, that's a bit more prescribed in terms of the position that can be altered quite well. When I said it comes down to your uh, interpretation of what's right, where the hoods are, how you feel with resting your hands on the hoods, that's very much a personal thing. So, common injuries really, um, again, spoke well briefly about the knee. I see a lot of necks. Um, I see the occasional um, disc injury in the middle of the back. Now, the, the significance of that is that, they're, 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 as far as data goes on back pain and neck pain, uh, to prolapse a bit of disc in the middle of your back is quite rare. Um, but they tend to be in certain side of and sometimes in the more drawn out mixed events like iron, not so much triathlon because you're not running for as long, but essentially with iron it can do as well, if you ever consider doing that. Um, taking good care of your thrusting spine is a, it, it, it is a must. Really. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, so uh, with this again, the upper extremities are more related to the length of the frame. Again, going back to the, the chap who came to was on the course who had um, his frame was too long. He was getting a lot of elbow pain, a lot of uh, nerve pain, and a lot of neck pain. And it was basically just the frame was just outsized for him. It just wasn't quite right. It was, quite, it was, just, oh, it was a weird thing to write because he was quite a big guy. You thought he'd be able to reach, but he was all leg. He wasn't necessarily. The body was pretty quite sh was fairly short. Um, okay. Um, these are just some quick things that can that can, that can be done. And there's a the, the quick fixes. There, there, there's a there's one that's not on there that I use quite a lot, um, just as a uh, as a very quick fix with any of my clients that come in, especially pertaining to neck pain again is the actual position you saddle, not necessarily forwards and backwards, but the angle of it. If it's flat, or if it's up, if it's uh, stuck and off the shelf, a lot of them can actually be tilted slightly backwards. So what that'll do with your pelvis is it'll tilt your pelvis backwards, which means that you have to reach further. And if you don't have that reach, um, the ladies amongst us probably will, uh, but guys are tend to be stiff as a board. Um, so you'll get the reach from somewhere, and that'll be overreaching with your thoracic spine, and then collapsing down through your neck. And you just be in the saddle all afternoon with that, 
I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll invite you to not feel a bit grumpy in the neck. So in terms of walking around day to day, if you were like this, walking around and you said to your friend, I've got a neck ache, he might tell you to not do that. And essentially that's what's happening when you've got the saddle in that position. So usually they're level, and on, on tri bikes you want them to stay level, but on a road bike you can play with it a little bit. I wouldn't obviously tilt a bike down and have you sliding off the front, you've got to be relatively safe with it, but essentially just one or two notches down should be, should be absolutely fine. Um, low back pain is a bit of a spooky one with cycling because obviously, the, as you can imagine, there are many, many, many different ways that someone can get low back pain. And I do find with sport in general, unless you're a professional athlete and that's what you do for your living, I find that sport is where you spot injuries. Very rarely the sport cause the injury. It's usually something you're doing day to day that you don't recognise, like sitting, um, that you might do, I don't know what you want, like. is everyone doing desk jobs or, you know, yeah. So if you sit for an eight and hour period during the day, that's way too long. You shouldn't be in that position for that long. You're not, you're not made to do that. Uh, you're made to move around. And so, uh, so that, that disc in your L4-5 space is being loaded for eight, nine hours, and you want to cycle and push a bit too hard, and you get a bit of pain. The cycling, Really highlights the problem. It doesn't do anything else. Uh, Achilles tendinopathy, um, again, a bit of a strange one with regards to cycling because I find the cycling makes it better uh, with a lot of my clients. They'll come to me with Achilles tendinopathy. And have you got Achilles tendinopathy? Have you? Um, I raised my hand. How did you? Um, usually, um, it's it's my triathletes that come with Achilles tendinopathy because they're running quite short distances, but trying to go for fairly high speed at the time, uh, good times and. What I find, uh, one of the main exercise parameters that I would use to treat a tendinopathy is what's called isometric training. So you, don't, you load the tendon, but you don't change the length of it. And if you're cycling with good discipline, you're loading the tendon, but you're not really moving the foot position. Your foot's not going up and down like that. So essentially, they usually report to me, oh, it's bad when I run, when I cycle, it's kind of all right. It's good, yeah. Where's that? Well, dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, the physio speak. Please put me up on any of that. Um, I tend to do it a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a few things that, oh, so cyclist palsy, that's a bit of a, yeah, on the nerve is what, is what you want from that. And tibialis anterior tendinopathy, that's a, a muscle, tibialis anterior, it's just the front side of the shin. Um, and that comes down into the foot, and it's usually the tibialis anterior. That, again, that's taken from a lot of uh, data and research done on triathletes who have usually been running as well. And so they get to be able to be anterior problems from lifting their foot up while they're running as opposed to the cycling. Uh, so there's sometimes the data that are fine and the research is a bit skewed. Um, another big one, this one, Morton's neuroma. Um, and that is just the compression of some neural tissue just where your toes are end. And there's a number of reasons. The shoe's too tight, it's a classic, uh, but again, it might not be the cycling shoes, it could be the fact that you wore your dress shoes that you wear to work or whatever are a bit too much. And then when you finally put your shit your cycling shoes on, the nerve could be in an irritated position already or an irritated condition. Um, if the saddle's too high, it causes you to reach down to the pedal and that can narrow that space, and that's why. Loosen the shoes, follow the saddle generally. Um, but what, to, I mean, but what I, I hope you can get from all this is that. If you had no pain and you just bought a new bike and you had a bike fit done, essentially they're going to set you up to perform better. When you've got the face of some tissue that's not quite right or you've got an injury, what was normal before is no longer normal. And so you're trying to, you're trying to adopt the position of a bike, or sorry, adapt the position of a bike to prevent the pain or to help you keep on going, get you through that event um, and take the stress off the morning to the wrong way through the therapy. That's a, quite a nasty little injury, really. It can be just pins and needles in your toes, and it can be pain shooting right up towards your knee every time you take a step. And uncomfortable. Um, so, getting your bike fit correct, or rather, not batting through pain, I think is, 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 is the number one thing I would say. Um, pay attention to what your body's covering. And these are obviously the knee pain being the most. Uh, significant of things I see, uh, conditions that I see, and these are just some of other um, fixes really. Or anterior knee pain. Anterior knee pain classic is where the kneecap just meets the, uh, the femur, so it just sits on top. 
Um, often you get told or you could be diagnosed by a doctor with uh, what's called chondromalacia patella. Um, that's just a really cute way of saying I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> Because there's no, there's no car, there's no nerve endings in the cartilage that's wearing away, or it's become fuzzy. So it can become fuzzy all at once, but you'll never feel a thing until you're bone on bone. And when you're bone on bone, you're probably like 75, 80 anyway. So you know, if you're still cycling 100 miles at that age, you're great. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the most lively one. You have other ones called uh, there's, a, there's a piece of tissue called a fat pad. It's in the knees, in the front of the knee, that can become quite irritated. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I've been a physio for the UK for 10 years now, um, and as far as I can tell, I'm sure there are people, maybe anatomists, that might disagree with me, but the fat pad, the only thing it does is live and breathe to annoy me. Um, they t they, it doesn't really have an anatomical job, like augmenting anything or, or doing anything. It has a really big blood and nerve supply, and it can become really sore really quickly and be a real problem, but it doesn't do anything just there to give you pain and you can find it it's if you everyone's it's usually different sized but if you think of it it's about that big the size of your hand span fold it up and wedge into the front of your joint and look to the front of the joint and you can get to it just either side of the, the tendon just the way you need that mine's quite baggy and fat so if i do running and i, I overextend the knee by accident i'll have a sore knee for a couple of days um, but yeah the other one in the anterior portion of the knee is tendinopathy, which or tendinitis, which you might all be familiar with. Um, <laughs> um, but they, uh, tendinitis in the Achilles is usually due to a weakness in the tissue. Conversely, tendinitis in the anterior knee is due to oh, you're too strong, so you, you put all of your force through that knee because of the area is a bit weak. So from a physio point of view, absolutely make the make the, uh, make the necessary adjustments to the bike, but there's going to be other things that you need to be doing. If you've got if you've got inherent weakness, in your right blood to your muscle, you, it doesn't matter how many big changes I make or whatever, you're still going to ride it efficiently and you need to sort that out with good old fashioned bit and sword or hard work really. You know, get in there and do some muscle work. Um, the medial knee, generally, be, generally pertaining to a ligament uh, called the medial collateral ligament or the, the cartilage on the inside of your knee. Um, the two, those two structures are actually joined together, they actually attach to each other. So when you injure one, you kind of annoy the other one by proxy. Um, and yeah, so essentially, feet too far from the cranks, so far from the foot going out within the knee in, um, and that can put a, a, a stress through the inside of the knee. And it might, it may be enough to annoy you, you may, you may never feel pain from it, you know. Uh, so, and I think that, I know, this is another thing I want you to take home from today is that biomechanics or the study of biomechanics and looking at some of the biomechanics is merely telling you what's there. Whether that causes pain or not is different for everyone. So uh, we do an orthotic service here. I have some patients that come to, to me and you look at their foot biomechanics and crikey, it's, it's just awful. But I know that when they move, their foot behaves really well, but in a stood position, it just looks like really flat arches, you know, no support at all. But their biomechanics are actually pretty sound. And you can get someone with great foot biomechanics, and when they do a squat, their knees are all over the place, they've got absolutely no control. So giving them an orthotic or fixing their biomechanics is going to be so, it'll get them so much better, not, not a lot better. Uh, posterior knee, saddle too high and too far back. Um, that usually is a neural problem. Um, and or, if, depending on age, generally this one, um, if there's any kind of wear and tear going on in the knee, you can have what's called vagus cyst, which is just fluid leaking out the back of the capsule. Uh, and the, the, the capsule comes round from the front to the back and kind of has a small hole that forms a bit of a one-way valve, so fluid can leak out and every now and again it'll swell. And if you're too far, you can you can seem to put a bit of pressure on that. Um, and fluid, um, going back to kind of GCSE chemistry, or liquid rather when it's compressed, it acts like a solid, so it can really feel firm, like there's something in there because you some fluid. Um, and it can then um, compress neural tissue and give you a bit of a problem. And that can in turn refer around to the front of the knee as well. Um, the ITB here, um, again, I find that the ITB um, <sighs> blamed for a lot, blamed for a lot, and actually guilty of not much. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tough bit of tissue. It's uh, just, it comes from the bottom muscles, it goes over the hip bone that you can feel on the outside there, and it comes down and attaches just to the outside of the knee. In reality, it does more than that, it comes right over the front of the knee into the calf. It's a huge, extensive piece of tissue, 
it has absolutely no control over how tight it is. Uh, it's what you're told you have a tight ITV, you have been told that before. If you don't have a tight ITV, you have more problems. An ITV is supposed to be tight, it's a load bearing structure, it's baggy, no good. Um, it also has roughly uh, the tensile strength of steel. So someone went after you, massaging you, telling you they're loosening your ITV. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> um, it can make it feel good. It can make it feel good because you release a lot of endorphins when it happens because they don't really have it. Anyone had that done? Sore, right? Very sore, right? Yeah. Um, I do. I do a lot of ITV work. Um, you know, I don't. I, whilst I, I try and adopt, I, I, I try and work on the tissue, especially for someone who's got acute pain, it's quite a nice thing to do, but I'll never do hard massage on it, ever. One, I hate having it done on me, so why would I do it somewhere else? And two, it just doesn't achieve anything apart from giving me arthritis in my hands. You know, it's not going to do anything. It's just, you've got to play with heat. It has to heat and the gentle persuasion to how these tissues evolve and how they, start, how they change. Um, but the ITB, generally, if you've got an instable, unstable pelvis when you're in weight bearing, whether it be through a pedal or the floor, if you've got an unstable pelvis, what will happen is you put one foot down, you drop it the other side, so the ITB kind of gets lifted up at this side. Also, you'll generally have an internal rotation of the femur. The femur goes in, and that's again the knee going in towards the frame, if you think about that. That can lengthen the ITB from this end, it takes the end away from the origin. And when that happens, you get what's called compression based injury, and that's why most people get it. Oh, I mean, I've had an ITB. Back for like years, and basically, one of my best mates was a physio. Mm. You know, he was doing weekly massages on it, getting right in there. Yeah, it felt like I was being tortured by the cell phone. No joke. And I was getting me a lot of stretching to do, yeah. uh, like the clam, just doing hundreds yeah. of uh, repetitions of that. But are you saying that's a waste of time? Uh, the massage, generally, yeah, I would say so. The actual strength work, no. Um, <sighs> All I can give you is the latest data and research right. on it. It's not a tendon. The ITV is not a tendon, it's connective tissue, it's fascia. But it behaves like a tendon when it's got pathology. And that's 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 what we that's what you need to consider. So um is there any would you pass me a bit of that red stuff in the bucket? Yeah. 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 Cheers. So this is Theraband, this is the physio's best tool. If you think that this is an this think this is a, think of this like a tendon or an ITB. If I was to take this end away from this end and this end away from this end, it would end up being stretched. Yeah. So this is a very routine way of just yeah, looking at it. This will get thicker if I thinner if I stretch it. It's thinner, but the bits in the middle don't. They just go longer, and what happens is they get squeezed by bits from the outside. So your ITB getting taken away from it, it's getting lengthened from what you're doing. Even only fragmentally, a tiny bit lengthened, you get a compression injury. With that, you get more water-based molecules accumulating just nearby, and that increases the whole pressure of the area goes up, so you feel pain. That won't be painful forever. That will be painful for the amount of time that you're in, it, it's annoyed, and that can be released by a bit of massage, it can be released by a little bit of exercise, but more often, the little bit of massage and the little bit of exercise gives you a break from the offending activity, and that's what generally gets people to feel better. Your pain is not, um, it's not, in my opinion, your pain is not uh, the problem; it's a symptom of a bigger one. So, you, if you what would be the what would be the what would be the root cure? The root of the always glute muscles, always. So, yes, clam is an yes. exercise that attacks the glutes. It's not very functional. How did you get the pain? Was it cycling or running or what? Uh, it was running, but sort of weight bearing running. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so weight bearing running. So, what were you carrying? Uh, Twenty-one pounds, like that. All right. What do you weigh? I weighed at the time. About 80, 80 up. So yeah. you just call it 80 kg. How much of that do you think goes through your knee every stride when you're walking without a bag? Four times your body weight. When you're running, 12 times your body weight through that knee. Every stride, and you had a bag as well, 21 pounds. Yeah, yeah, a lot of force going through that knee, a lot of force. Now these numbers are massive, aren't they? But they're irrelevant because you're kind of built to cope with it. But once you get, my point is, once you get pathology, nothing is normal. Once you get pain inflammation, nothing is normal. So doing normal things to get you right, hmm, it's, it's always going to have a little bit of a flaw to it. Now plan gets your glutes going, absolutely. But it's part, it's a very basic exercise and it needs to be more progressive. 
So looking at how you can differentiate movement, for example. Can you stand on one leg, keep your pelvis still, look straight ahead and wiggle your knee? I'll bet you can't. I bet you're all over the place. I bet you've got absolutely no control whatsoever. And so having a look at different things like that would have got you better. Uh, or will get will get, would you get me better? You know, there's definitely improvement. Yeah, the plan and yeah, and well, I mean, you know, yeah, all that change. stuff. Yeah, all that stuff helps. But I mean, the root is usually strength or lack thereof, and it's the ability to control rotation. You're doing a linear activity, you're running, but actually at your hip, you're rotating loads, and if you can't control that, then what happens? Things happen to you over you controlling things that go go on. It's the same on the, on the bike. You're doing linear things. But the actual rotation splaying out of the hip, there's massive amounts of rotation that go on at the hip during any revolution on the bike. So it's it's the under it's the misunderstood no biomechanical notions of what you're doing. Um, someone like a Paula Ratcliffe or a Mo Farah, they run hundreds of miles a week. Paula Ratcliffe, I was at Loughborough Uni doing sports science before I ever thought of even doing physiotherapy, and Paula Ratcliffe used to work out in the gym with it, in the same gym as me on every Tuesday morning. She was no slouch. She was strong as you like. Um, so, so you're at work, she's at work preparing for her runs, you're sat at a desk in a flex position and then you're getting problems in an extension activity. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably maybe jumping ahead a little bit, but essentially the activity that you're doing is not necessarily an easy one to do. You know, um, I can't play rugby for toffee, I've never tripped a rugby ball in my life. If I went out to Barnes and sort of tried to play, they'd teach me a few things before letting me on the side. They wouldn't just let me play on a Saturday, would they? They would go, you know, the team has to tackle, to fall, to pass, a bit of strategy. But no, just got a pair of trainers on, you're good to go. No. You haven't been taught how to run since you were a child, and even then you're not really taught much. So essentially, it's trying to get your biomechanics to perform the best for you, and that's essentially what we're trying to do with a bike fit. But one, uh, a bike fit as well, is just a biomechanical assessment. So again, it's a study of what's present, it's not a study of necessarily what's giving you an injury. Um, if you want, when, uh, when we're finished here, I can chat to you a bit more. Yeah. I'll to you a bit, a bit more in depth. Um, but um, essentially, uh, the work that we made did, all very good, but it, just, it, it may have fallen foul of what it should have achieved, or it should have been a bit more progressive, or something, I don't know. Yeah. You know, okay. I, you know, I'm sure there are people out there that I treated that want to see somebody else in this sort of Well, he didn't find heat, so I was just curious as to why you The heat all comes from my hands. I don't put hot water bottles on it or anything. I just do massage work, but I don't do pressing and elbows and bite this while I get you better, you know. Okay. <laughs> That's just a bit nicer. <laughs> um, alrighty. Uh, so, cycling, pain in the neck. Uh, we kind of touched on this before. This is, the big, this is the big guy. Continued extension of the facet joints, particularly C3 down to C6 and C7. Um, you only have seven vertebrae in your neck, but you have eight nerve roots. Um, so your C8 nerve root is usually the ulnar nerve, and if that's anchored forward, it can be really, really tethered. Um, so studies have shown 45% of riders suffer with neck pain after riding them on the foot. That's quite significant to me, that's nearly half. You know, and after 30 minutes, that's not a great amount. Minutes in the sand to get in neck pain. Um, so essentially, you've got to have that looked at. Now, I, fixing your saddle is a quick fix. It might not get rid of your neck pain. If you've got a bit more of a sense of pathology going on, no bike film, no, it's going to make that better. It's, it's going to take time and effort and probably a bit of therapy or a consultant review with an injection or whatever it is that is, you know, it depends on me <laughs> on what's wrong, you know. Um, but with simple neck ache, with simple things that are brought on by cycling, or you notice it when you're cycling, then I'd say the bike fit, if it's not been done, is a good way forward. Um, uh, strength and conditioning to the deep neck flexors, sorry again, DNF, sorry. <laughs> um, deep neck flexors are little muscles that sit on the front of your neck and generally let you kind of have muscles around your lower back on the spine. These guys, these are the ones that get wiped out when you've got any pain whatsoever. They're inhibited and they, they atrophy, they become smaller when you've got pain. It doesn't matter what the pathology is, it's the pain, doesn't it? Um, very same around the knee. If you ever have swelling in your knee or pain in the knee, usually this muscle here switches off, called VMO. And you'll see a lot of, but you know, you'll hear a lot about this. And if you ever go and see a sports medicine doctor, they'll tell you you have to strengthen your VMO, you don't. Uh, but then, then that's what they're there taught to tell you. Uh, but this down here would switch off because you've got fluid in your knee or you've got uh, pain or something. Mm -hmm. um, Levator scapulae, 
stretching, and that's a muscle that comes from the inside portion of your shoulder blade. There. So if you imagine your shoulder blades like a triangle, the corner inverted triangle, the bit that's nearest the spine that goes from there up right to the top of the neck. And this is the guy that's really, uh, really offensive when it comes to headaches. A lot of the reason why the traps, which are the bigger muscles that sits on top, you see, you see these. They, they, they get a bad reputation. They really do. And the reason that they do that is because there's politics involved with the research that goes around upper traps, dominance and pain and neck pain. Basically, if you have, if you want funding for uh, your muscle examination paper around the neck, you're only allowed to put muscle markers. Are you where they get the biofeedback, the electrical signals to feed out the computer to show what's working? You have to put them only in certain places. And one of those is straight over left scap. Where you're actually looking at the different muscle, but left scap's firing away underneath. And your chain, your, and so the journal says that this, this other muscle is, is, in, is, is, is the faulty one, but actually probably the one underneath. But they're not allowed to get funding if they, if they don't agree to the subscribed placement. I only found that out on the course I went on recently with a guy who was really in research. And you kind of, some journals are rubbish, some journals are great, but you don't realize how much politics goes into these things. Like, you know, so, so the research that you're reading now, if you haven't read anything on uh, by uh, Jenny McConnell on um, tendinopathy, what you're reading now, she probably completely disagree with you already. You know, and you see it, it's, it's taken four or five years to get through different channels to be actually to be published. So, um, Levator scapulae, that guy is guilty of a lot of sins, um, and it's usually when you're desk based because your posture and your adoption of certain posture will shorten it, and it's an aggressive lower muscle. Aggressive. And it usually leads to a compression of these joints because it shortens when in this position. Um, How do you stretch it? How do you stretch it? Very simple. Uh, sit up. Okay, so, oh, oh, that's it. And I want you to put the chin down towards your chest, but try and take your chin in towards your, your Adam's apple. Right? Now look under, pick an armpit and look under it. No, no, keep the arm still. Just take your head round towards it. See how you're having to move your, your whole body to do that? Yeah. That's good, that's tight. Right. So essentially when I go here, I look round, I can feel a pull there. It's not a stretch, it's a length test. Oh, yeah. And so you get into it that way. But however, have you noticed, do your general demeanor changes when you do that? Most people when they do neck stretches, or they like, for example, they'll get off the bike and they'll come in and say, oh, the next stretch, the next painful. <laughs> And they stretch it with like aggression, you know, it's like, oh, oh, and it's getting, you get really stressed out and then that kind of makes everything worse. So it's, it, you've got to be very gentle with these structures. They're aggressive, they're sore, but they, they, they're also quite delicate. Your neck's not, not the same as your lower back. It has a lot to contend with. It's, it's quite a, a specialized piece of kit. Um, thoracic stretches, I can't sing about enough. I think there are, everyone should be doing thoracic stretches and no one does them. There's uh, quite a significant piece of uh, research that shows that once you get hit about 25, uh, which I'm assuming everyone is, you two, are you 25 now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone else is. Um, the, 20, uh, the thoracic spine doesn't really ch change shape. So if someone's kind of like this and told to do loads of stretches and they'll magically make them like that and they're 42, it's just not going to work. It's, but essentially the mobility of what they have would improve so that each joint can move more in relation to the others. And so if you've got all of these vertebrae lined up and you've got a whole chunk of them that don't want to move, the movement burden is then placed onto other areas, namely the neck and the back, uh, the lower back. And these are the two areas, just by happy coincidence, that I seem to see a lot of you know, neck pain and pain and lower back pain. Um, check your helmet, centralised position and weight. Uh, probably least on my list of priorities with that. I can't, I've ever picked up a bike helmet and gone, wow, that's heavy. Um, physiotherapy, thoracic manipulation, CT junction manipulation, I do a lot of that. So where your neck, um, cervical spine, thoracic spine, CT, there's a junction. Uh, basically the vertebrae change shape and there's a junction between the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. And the, these areas where the bones change, change shape tend to be very, very susceptible to stiffness and pain. And when I do a, a, a manipulation, the crack that you hear is usually akin to a tractor changing gear. It's quite funny. Uh, whereas every other joint in the neck or, or in the back usually has quite a nice little clip. It's usually like clunk when someone's CT junction goes, it's quite funny. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, a, a decent bike setup 
is, I think, is, is paramount. Um, but also thinking about what can you do for yourself. You know, how can you manage things yourself? If you're if you're doing a lot of one activity and yet doing no preparation for that activity, you deserve your pain. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so a lot of my runners that come in and do you know 10k five times a week, and if not, then they go away on holiday for four months, for two months, and come back and then go straight back into 10k five times a week. You just can't do that. You, you know, you, you, unless you're made of rubber and magic, and I don't think many of us are. You know, so. Um, a bike fit, does it mean I'll be pain free forever? No, it doesn't. If you, if you don't look after yourself, no amount of biomechanical analysis is ever going to really rid you of pain. No one's going to do it for you. You've got to do the exercises, you've got to be strong enough to do the activity that you're doing. And strength, not just pertaining to muscle strength or tendon strength, it's also cartilage strength, bone strength, ligament strength. You know, do, are these structures powerful enough to, to hold the forces that you're trying to put through them? Um, and does it mean it can cycle more? I hear that a lot. You know, when can I get inside and do loads more? <sighs> hmm. um, again, it goes back to a preparation thing. I find it really does. Um, if, 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 you, if you adhere to whatever advice it is that you're told, uh, whether it be for an ITB problem when you're running, it's going to be totally different for an ITB when you're on the bike. Um, it could be back pain when you're sitting and you just want to get back to going around Richmond Park on Sunday. Your advice will be different, but you've got to adhere to it and you've got to follow it. Um, and then what can you do for yourself? There are very, very easy things that you can do for yourself. One, buy a foam roller, and a good one. Don't spend a lot of money on them. There's loads out there. If you go on Amazon, there's loads of like bubbles on them, holes in down the middle, so you it's all a gimmick. Like the lumpy ones that have spikes and things like that on them, they don't do anything more than the other ones that don't. It's just it's, they sell better. Um, and I think it's mine. Uh, where is it? There's a, those white ones. They're, they're really soft and they'll deform really quickly. You can get blue ones that are really firm. Um, mine, uh, but they're all quite long, so that you know, if you, the width, I always just go off your width. You know, you, unless you're using it for yoga or Pilates where you use it for balance, where you might lie along the length of it, and uh, you don't really need it to be very long. Um, mine is a little orange one that I've got at home. You can see just there, actually. That's not my one, but that is one. It's by a company called Escape. It's, in terms of it, being firm, I'm pretty sure that could survive like a nuclear holocaust out there. It's, it's properly hard, um, but it's good. It's really good. Um, I would always invest in one of them. I would, I would look at your training load, look at your training diary. You know, what are you doing? You know, is it is what you're doing? Is it is it too much? Be realistic with yourself. Um, also, um, you can get spiky balls as well. These things uh, we sell them here. You can get them online. Do whatever you want to do. They're pretty handy. They're good, especially getting into the glutes, because the foam rollers are quite good, but they're quite cumbersome as well, and you can't really fit one in the bag. Uh, whereas a spiky ball, you can just have it there. Great for posterior shoulder pain. Really good. Really good. Um, and yeah, so in terms of working for yourself, uh, doing things for yourself, I wouldn't be a physio if I didn't tell you to improve your core strength, <laughs> all of you. Um, but essentially, understand what that means. Core strength is not just here. Core strength is how this attaches to that, and how that attaches to that. And you link portions of your body through your core. So you could have strong legs, strong arms, strong core. They get really bad hinge problems because the three, the three bits can't link together. Um, that's a whole different chat. Um, but it's not, it's not uncommon for me to take someone who take, describes himself as relatively fit and you know, good at what they do, and I'll break them in half just with some simple core where I put it inside a couple of minutes. Um, and it's usually using a TRX or something like that that I, I generally hurt individuals with that. Um, that's my favorite pastime. Um, but yeah, so looking after yourself, I think, is, is a major, major thing. Technology has progressed so much. There's a really cool talk, actually, on TED. Um, I, got, I get emails from the now and again. There's a guy doing a talk, uh, basically one of those 15 minute talks, about how we've all got so much better at sport. And so like, it shows you like, how fast Usain Bolt is in comparison to Jesse Owens in the 30s and how fast you know, the, uh, the one minute, uh, four minute mile, whatever it is, and then how fast the cycling is becoming. And basically, the human power, the human strength is basically no different to what it was in the 30s. It's just technology has got a lot better. I find weak technology progressing. It provides a, a very convenient excuse for less work on your part. And that, it's the same with my office workers coming in and saying, have their desk set up looked at. 
that's just their boss's way of ticking the box and saying, no, you can sit for long end. But actually, it should be a full time walking around and doing stuff. So, on the, being on the bike and buying that more expensive gear or that more expensive trailer or whatever you want to get, it might won't be any substitute for your ability to control the forces that you subject yourself to. And I suppose that's where I would come at it from the physiotherapy angle. Yep, set the bike up, get the lasers out, straighten everything up, absolutely, get you feeling more and more powerful, more and more efficient, and laying your power down for things like, I think uh, we had a guy called Pat Lee he, today, he does a lot of VO2 analysis and power analysis on the bike. Without the appropriate setup, I can imagine your figures and his testing would really look different. Um, but looking after yourself to power. Um, any questions? <laughs> you weighed the bike to fit. Ah, yes. Book. Well, I haven't got a clear sense of what what bike fit is. What it is in the physical sense. Is oh, it, is, it, is it? I've seen a record frame. Yeah, yeah. Is it a load of equipment? And it should it be your bike, uh, turbo uh, trainer, uh -huh. me with a box of spanners and lasers. Right. Um, and I would draw on your shoes, and I would set up different parts. All kinds of bikes. Uh, road bikes. Road bikes, yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking to do more, more types of bikes, uh, but mountain bike setup, as you can imagine, you've got heavy suspension, you've got everything there, so it's a very different discipline. Why? What? Why? Why, 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 why? why is it different? Why is it different? The bike's totally different. Yeah. The kit's totally different. The, 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 the position's the totally physics. different. The physics. The physics. The physics are different. different. No, the physics are completely different. You don't get suspension on a road bike. Yeah. And, well, not really. I haven't seen much. Yeah. <laughs> the, the guys that come in here don't mm. have it. And um, on the mountain bike, it's just different. It's just totally different. Um, I'm sure that the powers that be that teach this thing are granted they probably want to make more money out of me <laughs> by sending me on these courses. Um, it, it's just an incredibly different kit. So the, the saddle heights, the saddle, you know, the saddle units, the strength of the frame, the, the makeup of the frame, everything's totally different. So everything's, everything is just different on a mountain bike fit. I wish I could do more, um, but essentially, uh, so until I can afford to go on the course and do it, uh, I, can't, I can't afford to, I can't, I can't do that just yet. But road bikes, what I see anyway, I see probably at all of my cycling injuries, I'd say about 5, maybe 6, 7 percent mountain bike based. If I was up north at home, probably more would be mountain bike based, because I'm from the Lake District and it's massive. Um, but road bike, road bikes around here are very uh, key. So, yeah. Hello. Um, one of the problems I get a lot of is knotting in my muscles. Sorry? Knotting in my muscles. Knotting, no, yeah. Money. Is there anything you suggest to kind of uh, stop that from happening or to get rid of it? Yeah, um, I'll need a bit more specific. When you say knotting, what do you mean? Where, where, where in the leg? Like, like, like my thighs kind of... In your thighs specifically? Feel like, like little mountains. Does it stop you in your tracks? Do you have to stop yeah. for the pain that you can carry on? Yeah. So it's not a pain leg thing? No. Um, First of all, with the quads, the muscle, the, the type of muscle tissue is slightly different to your calf, for example. Yeah. It's a different type of muscle belly. Essentially, it'd be interesting to look at your actually look at your hydration. Um, yeah, and, and find out what kind of sodium levels you have in your sweat, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if that's if you have high sodium, sodium sweat levels then that can lead to short circuits in the skin muscles. Yeah. Uh, purely because sodium is a major, major chemical you need, a major um, electrolyte that you need for decent signal passing in terms of your signals. Yeah. Um, that as well, and looking at what's not working, why is it that you're getting on, it sounds like you're very quad heavy on your bike. Mm. So if your glutes aren't working heavily enough to pull you into extension, you're gonna really lean on your quads more, and so it might, be something like that too, and, and you know, yeah, bike fitting, yeah, absolutely would help you. But also looking at your central drive. So, if I gave you a squat to do or a lunge, how good are you? That's it. You know, yeah. can you can you control your legs? Do you glutes work? Is it you know, everything? It would be a lot of things that come into that. Simple manual therapy oh. might make you feel better for a while, but it sounds like you know you've got it. Going on with a spiky ball or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All great for pain relief, all great yeah. for things from time to time. Don't go away no, no, so there's something more in depth there. I would imagine it's a mixture of probably that and the likelihood of, you know, glutes just not really working as well as they should be. Yeah. To be honest, if I, I don't, I think I've, in, I have to say the last year, I think I've had like two clients who I'd say have sufficient glute activity. Mm. And I see a lot of that, a lot. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think it's because we sit all the time. 
it's, you know, we're flexible, flexible options all the time. These muscles are extensor muscles. So the posterior chain, all the muscles from the back of your head down to your heels, is usually insufficient. And we depend on them a lot more than we think. Uh, so I would be very inclined to do that. But um, obviously hydration testing and everything costs money. So look into it at your own, at your own peril. But sodium uh, content in your sweat is, is more influential than people think. Back in the day when I was at university, it was for me and the three of the lads in the lab with a big computer looking at you now. You just sit down and strap you into your arm and you push your feet out. So a Gatorade might not actually be any good for you at all. And water may be useless. You might need a really high salt content in, in, in things. It might be that you don't need any of that, you know? It, so it, just, it could just be a power thing, and yeah. a strength thing from other muscle groups. Would that be linked in any way to rehydration after a long ride, your sodium level? Um, your ability absolutely. to rehydrate? Yeah. So yeah. if you've lost a lot of sodium, yeah. can you, is it possible that you drink a lot and feel, still feel thirsty? Um, yes, it can, because if you... When you, sodium is actively passed across the wall, your small intestine, whereas water is, is, is passing the channel across. So a lot of these drinks have salts in them, so the water is pulled across because the, the active channel and transfer of the sodium will yank the water molecule across. So just drinking water, what you usually do, the old runner's trick, is you have to teach yourself to train with fluid in your stomach, it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the runners train, like, like to train with high volumes in the stomach, so it actually causes more osmotic pressure, so it literally pushes things through. Uh, but if you get the sodium balance right, you get the, even if it's just like a, I know it's not the nicest thing in the world, but if you just get a handful of salt and put it in a pint of water, shake it around and get rid of it, that would, that would do it, you know. But essentially, um, it's more, that is more of an exact science. So you want quantifying the, some quantified measurements for you really. Um, but I'm not, I wouldn't for a second suggest that you need to have that done at a cost of your own. I would say look at the simple things first. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, then maybe later. A lot of the guys who do like the marathon de Sable, they have a better standard. Yeah. Um, and yeah, with better results. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 um, I've just been introduced to the, the torture of the phone roll. <laughs> and, and what? And it's sort of recovery, I've yeah. three months in a cast, so I'm oh, trying right. to up to the side. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What would you recommend in terms of usage, like is it pre-exercise, post-exercise? Oh, no, no not nothing. I, I do little and often, right. little and often. I think uh, you can use it too much, you know, you can, uh, and it can become quite an addictive thing. You know, not for me, personally, I don't know how it can yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But some of my clients actually love it, they become like little sadists, and they just right. love the pain. And you, they come in with horrendous bruises down the outside of their legs, and Number one, though, don't roll on it. Do not. <laughs> it should be called a cylindrical massage device, not right. a foam roller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see people rolling up and down yeah. all the time on it, and you give yourself a nice surface proof, but you don't. You do relatively little tissue underneath. Quick recovery. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, what if I was uh, massaging an ITV or a muscle in your back? I would tend to basically find a spot, stay on it until you say it doesn't hurt anymore, then move and find a different one. So when you're doing a foam, foam rolling, you would roll very slightly, find the spot that makes you want to cry, yeah. and then when that sort of eases a little bit or changes, and it'll never go away, it'll just change, then move again, um, and keep, yeah, keep, keep doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, three months in a cast, I mean, everything about the self-management and the taking care, you know, you've got it all ahead of you. Mm -hmm. um, what you don't want is in six months to get some crappy ankle injury, or some knee injury because your, your strength has been told you know, you're alright and that you sat in my office with a plantar fasciitis or something because you've got no strength in your glutes or something yes. like that. Yeah. Which I see a lot of uh, ACL reconstruction is a great one where people have broke the ligaments and you get rebuilt from the hamstrings. And uh, yeah, last week I had a guy <laughs> who <laughs> said uh, at the end of the assessment, I was like, you sure isn't it? you've never had an injury? Are you sure there's nothing? And right at the end, oh yeah, I, I ruptured my ACL two years ago. Like, for an hour, and um, basically, he had tested his hamstring strength where he said his rehab had been complete and everything was fine. He had absolutely no hamstring strength whatsoever. Um, and so, yes, his knee was sore and his foot was sore, and he, one major muscle group was completely deficit. Um, so, essentially, for you, you know, absolutely all of this is majorly pertinent. Yeah, majorly pertinent. Yeah. 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 My injury was caused because of imbalance. Right. Um, now for three months. Yeah. What was the injury? Um, uh, Achilles tendon complete rupture. 
Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, oh, that, needs to, that needs a bit of attention. One there. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. oh, fair. Yeah. Oh, right. You're in mean hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, at least you know what the problem is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you rupture a tendon, you know, like you kill his tendon, if you've, you've done something enough to rupture that, you've done enough to damage him to either side as well. So, just think on with that. You've got two big nerves up and down the side of it. And uh, that, was a, that was a a significant injury to kill the Well done now. Yeah, do a good job on yourself. Well mm. um, yeah. yeah. Any others? So if I'm going to walk down the road, going to help us yeah. buy a bike, yeah. what, you know, after all this is good information, mm -hmm. what's the key sort of things, you know, frame size? Frame sizing. How do you properly size? How do you properly determine it? Because oh, the, the, the guys in the shop, are, they're, they're gifted enough at frame sizing. It's measure, basically measuring your inside leg and sizing your up. And these guys live and breathe bikes, so they, they, they know what they're talking about. It's frame sizing falls on its back end when people buy things online or don't get a chance to try stuff on. Uh, so yeah, frame sizing is absolutely paramount. And a bike fitting, the success of it, I think, really hinges on it. Um, it there, are, there, are, there are certain bike fits that I've done where we had to stop halfway because we just couldn't get any further. Um, because it's just, well, there's no point in going on and doing this. You're going to have to buy this and buy that until you get all that kit we can't do this. And all of a sudden, like that 500 quid bike is starting to look like it's costing nearly a thousand pounds. And <laughs> um, but all of these, all of these, all of these things will just be recommendations anyway. But a good bike sizing. And even if they can do it, they, you know, like a, a stack and reach, they can, they can do that, just, you know, maybe adjust the saddle and look on it, just give you a once over. But a good sizing is paramount. Um, and I don't think, my, in my opinion, you know, I suppose you pay more for composite materials, you pay more for everything else, but I don't necessarily think that you have to spend a thousand, a thousand on a piece of bike. Just push on. Well, no, I mean, the health of yourself, yeah. actually. The health has got the, the team organ, which is the huge mm. carbon robot. Yeah. Mm on the bike to work team. Mm -hmm. Obviously Halfords have got notorious for not knowing Shimano from an Eskimo. Oh right. So well, I don't know. I, mean, I, I got my bike from them. Yeah. Well, my guy was alright. Okay. He, I think it is just a, you know, I, I think as a company you might you might only employ idiots, but um, I think every now and again you'll find it, yeah, and it is just an individual thing. Um, I, I, in, that, in which case, I don't know if you bought the bike. Not yet. Not right. yet. Maybe research somewhere else, like putting your side. Yeah, no, no, because help is at that team. Oh, right, exclusive. Right, yeah, no, yeah, of course they do, don't they? No one else has it. No. It's, it's exclusive to help, but help is not. Like oh, Dino's Sport, they've got every other car, every other, yeah. every other Portland bike, but they're not allowed that Portland Maybe they're bike. catering for numbers. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, I don't know, maybe just speak to them. I'll well, only buy the bike if I can speak to someone who knows about bikes. <laughs> so, yeah. the frame, so the frame size and everything else, or decent frame sizing, yeah. And absolutely. everything else you can work on with the yeah. same size. Yes.